when Matthew McGough and his daughter Shannon get lost in the Australian outback. Their camping trip descends into a living hell. Shannon, get out! Run! Now! It was the worst moment of my life. Matthew faces a desperate battle to save his daughter. It was just like, it's hopeless. We weren't going to make it. In one of the most hostile places on Earth. We played together, laughed together, <laughs> cried together, and now we're going to die together. Sweetheart, you ready? Yeah. yeah. In a remote town in Western Australia, Matthew McGough and his young daughter Shannon are about to set off for an overnight fishing trip. Shannon's my only child. We had a really good relationship, really um, real friends as well as father and daughter. Um, got on along really well. We always used to laugh and play together a lot. For Shannon, trips away with her dad are always something to look forward to. Me and my dad were pretty close. We used to go away on weekends a lot. Mom, we're going! We'd go fishing, bushwalking, go camping and stuff, because that was the kind of thing he liked to do. Be safe. Matthew is recently separated from his wife, Irene. But she knows how much Matthew cares for Shannon, and she's more than happy to see them spend time together. Shannon loved camping. And so they used to quite regularly go on camping trips and nothing ever happened, so there was never any reason to worry. We're off, sweetheart. They live in a small town on the edge of Australia's Great Victoria Desert. A terrain Matthew knows well. The only way to get to see the countryside is to get off the beaten track. And that's the ruling I've always lived by. The plan today is to drive just 40 miles into the outback, camp for the night, and head back the next day. Than you. No, he didn't. <laughs> he didn't. No, he didn't. Matthew wants to make this trip an extra special one, as he's about to move 1,500 miles away. And this may be their last weekend together for some time. So he takes Shannon to his favorite rock pool. It was our last trip. We were going to see each other for a while. So that's made a bit more special. Well, it's just a case of spend some time with Shannon for the last week or so before I took off. Have you caught anything, Dad? Uh, nothing yet, sweetheart. Uh, maybe later, eh? That night, father and daughter enjoy an idyllic evening together in the outback. One of my favourite parts was probably laying, like, under the stars and, like, watching them and... Dad would point out things that he knew from his childhood. Yeah, and just checked out the stars and the moon and listened to all the nightlife coming out to play. Like a kind of a bonding thing, which was good. All right, let's go, sweetheart. The next morning, 
They're due to head back home. It's been a great trip, but one thing is missing. They haven't caught any fish. Shannon sort of looked up underneath the hair and you could see she was a little bit disappointed. So before returning Shannon home, Matthew decides to take a detour to try and catch her some fish. Listen, sweetheart, I've got an idea. Jump in. I sort of had a bit of an idea where there was another dam, uh, a fair way away, but um, yeah, had a general idea about where to go. Getting to the fishing spot means heading a further 50 miles away from civilization, far deeper into the outback. It's a vast expanse of desert, covering more than 100,000 square miles. Dangerous and inhospitable, one of the hottest places on Earth. The Australian outback is an unforgiving place. It's very harsh. The heat, you're looking 45 degrees Celsius. Stinking hot, simple as that. But Matthew is confident that he knows the area well and has come well prepared. About 20 litres of water, spare tyres, food, tent and all that. I reckon I took pretty much all I needed to take. Matthew and Shannon drive for over two hours, deeper and deeper into the desert. But there's no sign of the water hole. We're just pretty much going through a bush track not well defined on the ground or anything. It's just a virtually couple of wheel tracks going through the scrub. His 4x4 is a tough vehicle, but Matthew is driving in ever rougher terrain. Are you kidding me? You stay here, it's all right. Uh, it's a tyre. It's no problem. <sighs> Matthew has come well prepared and has three spare tyres on board. I wasn't in particularly good mood of changing a tyre that time of the day. I was sweating, yeah, I was bloody soaked to the bone. Tire fixed and two more spares in the back. Matthew is still confident he can find the fishing spot. But the desert is strewn with boulders and sharp rocks. I'd only gone a couple of miles and then uh, I had to change another tyre. It's now mid-afternoon. The hottest time of the day, with temperatures hitting 115 degrees Fahrenheit. And Matthew begins to have doubts about his quest to search for the rock pool. I was just wondering whether it was all worth it or not, pretty much. But still eager to live up to the promise he made to Shannon, Matthew decides to press on. Hey. We'll be fine. Let's keep going. By my calculations, we're about halfway from where we'd come from to where we were going. And um, what's the point of turning around? Might as well continue on.
by late afternoon and 60 miles out into the desert. Matthew fears he's losing his way. I'm sure it's around here someplace. I sort of run out of road, I lost me track. I was sort of a little bit worried that we hadn't got to where we were going. I could actually tell that Dad was worried. I knew something serious was going on. With just one spare tire left, Matthew abandons his quest to go fishing and decides that it's time to get Shannon home. I had one more spare tire, but the way I was going through the tires, I didn't think I had enough. Dad, hmm? are we going to be all right? Daddy again, Dad. Eh? I was pretty peeved about the idea of getting a third puncher. Again, in a stinger neat. Matthew knows that the 4x4 is their only way out. But with no more spares, another puncture could be fatal. With hundreds of miles of scorching desert all around, there's no way they could ever walk out of here alive. You know what, Yep. Yeah. Good. All right, let's go. Are we lost, Daddy? Shannon said, oh, we lost Dad, and I said, oh, I think so. Um, you know, um, no use lying to her, you know. Matthew presses on, hoping to come across a track which will lead them to safety. just when he thinks he's making progress. The 4x4 suddenly stops in its tracks. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. started rubbing my head thinking what the was going on why me why such bad luck John Parks we're not we are not going anywhere we've run out of track we've run out of spares we're stuck I was supposed to have Shannon back that night and we weren't going back that night there was no way in the world as darkness falls Matthew and Shannon have no choice but to camp out for the night. Oh, I mean, if it had been just me, it wouldn't have been no matter, but I had Shannon with me. She was my main concern. She's always my main concern when she's with me. And in the remote outback, he's unable to call his ex-wife. If I could have phoned home, I would have, but yeah, no reception, absolutely no signal whatsoever. At that point, I was thinking that, yeah, I might have made the wrong decision by not turning around and going back. We'll be fine. Let's get going. I was calling myself the biggest idiot under the sun. Morning brings with it fresh hope. The cold of the night has hardened the ground enough for Matthew to free the four by four. We did it, sweetheart. Well, well, that's it. We were feeling really good. It was great to get out. No worries at all. 
pretty happy that we're going to get on the way again. Woo! We are going home. Yeah! Woo! But they've hardly got moving when disaster strikes again. Another puncher. I was cranky. Man, was I cranky. Got no more spares. And yeah, we're in trouble. Big time. All right, sweetheart. I've got a plan. Matthew knows that driving with only one flat tire at the rear will put massive strain on the car's axle. So he does what he has to to keep it moving. He lets down one of his inflated good tires. He also tries to hide from Shannon the seriousness of their predicament. You all right, Dad? I'm saying, sweetheart. So I ended up having two tight tyres on the front and two flat tyres on the back. OK. We're off. Let's jump in. They crawl along at only five miles an hour completely lost in the vast, burning desert. I was in four-wheel drive, I'm just pushing along, straighten the steering wheel up and just kept going. Okay. You'll be fine. Yeah. But running the car on two flat tires in this scorching heat is putting enormous strain on the engine. We're in four-wheel drive, which brings up the revs of the engine a little bit. And um, because I was concentrating on what I was doing, I wasn't watching the temperature of the radiator, and it boiled. Matthew now faces a huge dilemma. Their car is their only means of escape, but will go no further without water. We had to put some water in the radiator, otherwise it would have kicked the cooked tomato. But he has only 20 litres left. And in the raging heat of the outback, water is the key to survival. It's a huge risk, but Matthew is determined to get Shannon out of the desert and home safely. I put 10 litres of water in the radiator and I kept 10 litres for Shannon and myself. <laughs> Matthew struggles on. But the strain on the engine is massive and it soon needs even more of his dwindling water supply. The car just seemed to be overheating all the time and my dad really didn't make out that it was a big deal. I'm sure inside he was probably really scared himself, but he didn't let it show. By midday, the desert temperature hits 115 degrees. Whether it was an electrical fault or whether it was dry grass 
pushed up around underneath the hot exhaust system. I don't know, but I notice smoke coming out from underneath the bonnet. He has just seconds to grab whatever possessions he can. Stay back, right, baby! Before the car explodes into flames. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. They can do nothing as they watch the car burn. Their only means of escape is destroyed. And we just sat there and watched it burn, and I was giving her a cuddle and trying to reassure her that it would be right. And yeah, she was scared. She was very scared, yeah. What started as an innocent fishing trip has turned to disaster. Matthew's only way of getting Shannon out of the desert is gone. He just looked really worried and, I don't know, there was just the, a vibe about him. He wasn't his normal happy self, so I could tell something was wrong. What's wrong, Daddy? I told her there and then that we were lost. Good time, big time. Um, that I'd do everything that I could to get, it, get us out of the mess. I'm gonna get you home, okay? I promise. I couldn't whinge or complain about it. I had to be determined and had to be brave because there wasn't really much else I could do. It's been 36 hours since Shannon was due home. Her mum, Irene, has called the police and they've launched a search. Hello? Nothing at all? But there's still no sign of Shannon and her dad. All right. All right, just let me know, all right? It was just really, um, really scary. I couldn't sleep. I was just worrying where they are and it... There's nothing you can do. You want to do something, but you, but you can't. The fire has taken almost all their possessions. They're left with just the outer cover of their tent, a few tins of food, and just two litres of water. I knew water was going to be a fairly big issue. We didn't have a lot of water. In the sweltering heat, Shannon is already suffering the effects of dehydration. I remember my skin felt really dry and tired and having headaches and feeling dizzy. In these extreme conditions, an average person needs at least one litre of water per hour. Oh, I sort of thought then that Shannon going to have to keep an eye on what she drank, you know, like I had to ration her. Again, I still wasn't drinking much. I'd probably have a sip here and there and that was it. Sort of try and conserve the water for Shannon more than me. I probably needed it more than she did, but hey, <laughs> it's not the way you think at the time. Matthew set out wanting to make his weekend with Shannon a special one. But he now knows they're both in big trouble. I was not real happy with myself. I was a driver, I was a dad. It was my fault that we were there. But can't dwell on it too much, gotta to do something about it and that's all I was doing and that's what I was gonna do.
It's been two days since the car caught fire, and Matthew is determined to get Shannon to safety. But stranded in the endless expanse of outback, their situation is looking bleaker with every passing hour. Then, on the horizon, Matthew spots something. It's an old radio tower, a possible lifeline. And I thought maybe I could get it up there and get some mobile phone reception, you know, get up high, get a signal. He knows the best chance of them being rescued is to stay put. The golden rule in the outback is don't leave your vehicle. If somebody is in the area and can find you, they'll come to that vehicle. But he also knows that they're now so far from their original fishing spot that any search party could take days to find them. The golden rule goes out of the window when you don't think there's any possible chance of anybody finding you where you are. Sweetheart, we're gonna get going. With precious little water left, Matthew is not prepared to sit and wait and risk watching his daughter die. Well, I had to sort of think about how to get us out of there, so... Look at the water? It seemed the right thing to do to head for that hill. Help me. Oh, man. But distances in the outback are deceiving. And already severely dehydrated in the 115 degree heat. It's a decision that could kill them. didn't seem that far away, but because it was so hot, we had to stop heaps and heaps of times. It's all right. It's all right. That's it. That's it. Come on. The closer we got to it, the distance just seemed to go further and further and further. It seemed that we were never going to get there. A lot of sweating, a lot of reassuring Shannon we'll be right. So, it's pretty harsh. It takes four excruciating hours for Matthew and Shannon to finally make it to the tower. It's a rickety old structure, but his only hope of gaining enough height to get a signal and call for help. The dangers of climbing a mast, falling, breaking my neck, leg, whatever. Just didn't think of it, just did it. Careful, Daddy. I had to get the highest point that I could to see if I could get a signal from my mobile phone. But he's just so far out in the desert that even at this height, there's not even the faintest signal. So I stuck it back in my pocket and climbed back down the mast. Disappointed. It's their fifth night out in the wilderness, and they now face yet another challenge. The temperature suddenly plummets to below zero, and without their tent, they're at the risk of hypothermia. That night, the temperature's dropping. It is freezing cold. It's getting colder and colder on hard ground. I kept building fires so Shannon could keep warm. 
I wrap myself around her to try and get my body heat into her. I couldn't sleep at all. Uh, I was too worried about getting us out of there. And even though Shannon was there with me, I just felt so alone. Matthew and Shannon have been living on scraps of food and sips of water for nearly three days. We're virtually down to no water, and I think we're on our last can of food. Out of options, they can only sit and pray for rescue. The helicopter sort of came towards the mast. Sweeter! Sweeter! There's a helicopter! Over here! Help! Help! A search helicopter flies by almost directly overhead. Over here! But in the vast expanse of the desert, they're just too tiny to be spotted. I just felt... Devastated. I was just, yeah, felt lousy, absolutely lousy. Just couldn't believe they didn't see us. In the hope that the chopper may return, Matthew decides to send up a smoke signal. I was thinking that. Why not start a bushfire? Surely that would attract somebody's attention. In the arid outback, the desert scrub is like a tinderbox. Well, the fire caught a lot quicker than what I thought it would. Suddenly, the wind changes direction. And the acrid smoke billows over them. Wrap my arm around her and pulled her head in towards my chest because the smoke was so thick. We were choking on it. The fire dies, but the smoke fumes force them to drink the last of their precious water supply. It's also burnt all of their remaining possessions. They're now left completely exposed to the ravages of the Australian outback. It's now been 12 hours since their water ran out. A lack of water will kill an adult within days. But Shannon is just a small child. It just seemed like we weren't going to make it. Not one thing that I was trying to do to save us or to get us rescued or to attract attention was working. Over here! I told Shannon that if we don't get found today, I doubt very much whether we'll get through tomorrow. I doubt very much at all. All I wanted was just to go home and having my dad tell me that that might not happen, that I might not be able to do that, it was, it was quite, quite upsetting for me. It made me feel useless. It's a big letdown for yourself when you feel like you can't provide for your, for your daughter in the way you should. Matthew decides that their only hope of being spotted is to strike out in the direction from which the helicopter came. The reason I thought it going down towards the open ground 
people that have more of a chance to see us. But walking on in the blazing midday sun only dehydrates them further. The heat, flies, mosquitoes at night, dust. No sleep for three days and nights. I was stuffed. No other way of putting it. I was absolutely knackered. Shannon can take little more. The heat has exhausted her, and she's now so weak, she can barely walk. I wish that I had the energy to be able to pick her up and carry her, but I didn't have that. I might take two or three steps, but yeah, that was it. I had to put it down again. I couldn't do it. That's probably a very, very hard thing for a dad to, or for any person, I'd say, to be able to understand that you can't pick your own girl up, you can't pick your own child up and carry her. Uh, you just don't have the energy to do it, and that's a pretty hard thing to come by, eh? to understand. Very hard. It's now been 24 hours since Shannon has drunk any water. Desperate, Matthew considers a terrible option, giving her a drink of his own blood. That idea came from watching documentaries on telly. I know there's some African tribe over there that can cut the vein on a on a cow um, and drink the blood from it. I got the knife and I put it on my wrist and uh, applied some pressure. But it didn't happen and I realised that my knife was just way too blunt. What are you doing, Daddy? It was sort of a last resort, really, you know? Matthew had wanted this weekend to be a very special one with his precious daughter. Now he knows that without water or rescue, she could be dead within hours. Yeah, we had a big cry together, even though there was no tears. There was a lot of sobbing, but there was no tears whatsoever. We were too dry to even cry a tear. And even to think about it now, like, I feel sad. I feel like I want to burst out in tears, actually. So, so yeah, you know, it's just one of those things. Um, and I'd hate to ever put Shannon through that again. Back at her home, Shannon's mum is running out of hope that her daughter will be found alive. Looking up to the heavens and thinking, you know, if you're there, you know, show yourself by bringing her home. I would have promised everything and anything to have, to have her back safe, yeah. Their plight is hopeless, but Matthew won't give in till he's done everything he can to save Shannon. I couldn't sleep. I had to get us rescued, and that was all I was taught. I got a log burning, and I took that out onto the flat and just started waving it around. Hello! Just trying to get attention, somebody's attention, anybody's attention. Help! 
from out of nowhere, this bloody set of headlights are heading straight towards. coming towards us and then it just veered off. Over here! The driver of the vehicle doesn't see him and their chance of rescue disappears into the night. That feeling of elation just got shot down in flames. To see those tail lights disappearing into the distance was just the worst moment of my life. With the chance of rescue gone, Matthew is convinced that he and Shannon will not survive the night. We played together, laughed together, cried together, and now we're gonna die together. Rescue efforts have failed to find Matthew and Shannon McGough, and they've gone two days without water in the ferocious heat. Extreme dehydration is causing Shannon's organs to shut down. She and her dad are both close to death. I doubt very much whether we would have survived an eighth day. Pretty bloody sure of it, actually. Then, just when all hope is lost. They come across a track. It's where the car must have driven past them the night before. I was not going to leave the track. We're following it in the hope that this vehicle would come back or another vehicle had come through. But Shannon can go no further. <laughs> Shannon wasn't saying much at all. Yeah, very, very quiet. I'd speak to her and she shake her head or nod her head up and down, but she wouldn't speak, so, hmm, disheartening. Exposed to the scorching desert sun, Matthew needs to protect his dying child from the unbearable heat. It was boiling. The heat had risen big time. It was hotter than the last few days. And I knew that I needed to get Shannon into the shade. So I dug a hole in the ground so that I could put Shannon in it and then cover her back over. And that would keep her a bit cooler than sitting out in the open. But in this remote part of the outback, there's no guarantee they'll see another car for days, even weeks. Matthew knows he may have just dug his daughter's grave. Um, extremely sad because I'd brought my daughter out into this wilderness and that I'd put her life in danger. After eight days battling to keep himself and his daughter alive, Matthew finally gives up. It was just like 
it's hopeless. There's nobody here, nobody can see us, nobody will see us. We were gonna actually die of thirst, a slow, agonising death. Dad rushing back over and waking me up and saying that he'd been found. After eight days in the outback, their ordeal is finally over. I felt an enormous weight lift off my shoulders. I felt fantastic. I still remember the car pulling up and this little girl coming out and me just crying and crying and putting her in my arms. And she said, um, I know why you're crying, Mum, because you're happy to see me. And I was, yeah. Doctors estimate that when Shannon was found, she had just a few hours to live. Yeah, I'd say it's a miracle. Despite their ordeal, Matthew and Shannon are still close and still go camping together. Dad probably takes more supplies now and we don't go as far, but doesn't really change the fact that we still go camping. I think there was a stronger bond as a result, although the next time we went camp and I wanted to go down this track and she said, don't you dare, Dad, you stick to this one. <laughs> so, yeah. 